The quantum cascade laser is an electronic waterfall. Essentially, we design and then build a uh, semiconductor ma uh, material, such as when you apply a voltage to it. What happens that the electrons uh, go through the actual material, and because it is designed as an energy staircase, at every step that the electrons jump down, they, uh, they, they emit a laser photon. So it's a fundamentally new laser principle. And uh, the key point is, by engineering, by designing, by changing the size of the energy step, we can actually change the wavelengths. So conceptually, it's very simple. In this way, this is an, is an artificial material, which is man-made, where we can design the emission wavelengths across a region of the spectrum called the mid-infrared to far-infrared, which goes from a few microns to hundreds of microns, where until now, until the advent of the quantum cascade laser, you just had only a few lasers that could emit just a few wavelengths. Right now, with the QCL, we can cover most of it. And most important, once we even make a laser at a particular wavelength, we can actually tune around it a large, uh, pretty large range. So these are lasers that are tailorable in a sense that you design the wavelengths and tunable, that once you fix the design by changing the, uh, the current and the temperature, you can actually do a pretty large uh, uh, tuning of the wavelengths. So the application space has opened up is huge. Why? Because until its advent, again, it was a sparse region of the spectrum where, you know, large, but there were not too many laser sources. Okay, the uh, famous one is a carbon dioxide laser. It's very powerful, but it can emit only a, a few wavelengths. So I can tell you about the application that space that it's open is huge. Why is it huge? because most molecules absorb light in the so-called mid-infrared region. This is the region where molecules vibrate or actually rotate. So an obvious application, if you can make a laser that you can select the wavelength so it targets a particular molecule, you can use these lasers for chemistry, for sensing, for spectroscopy. There is a large number of applications that has opened up from industrial type of application, so called industrial process control. You are manufacturing certain chemicals. You want to keep under control in the steps of production of a chemical, certain chemical compounds. So you need sensors. And what people have shown, my group and many others, that uh, using quantum cascade laser, you have a unique sensitivity, the ability to detect chemicals down to parts per trillion in volume. So this opens up application to counter-terrorism, obviously, security at airports, uh, and fundamental studies of atmos atmospheric uh, uh, chemistry. Quantum cascade lasers, in the words of my uh, colleagues at Harvard, uh, Professor Jim Anderson and Professor Steve Wofsey, are revolutionizing atmospheric chemistry because of their ability. They flow these uh, quantum cascade lasers in aircrafts that go start very low from the troposphere to the stratosphere. These are both men, these are both manned aircrafts and Rob and uh, robotic aircrafts, and they've been able to measure tiny concentration of the greenhouse gases with high precision at various heights from low close to the ground to very high. And this is important from prediction of climate change. So applications are opening up in the medical field. Breath analysis is a very exciting one for diseases. You know, the idea is very simple. You breathe into a chamber, okay, a laser bounces back and forth. You tune the laser, 
And if you see by tuning the laser at some point, light is ab absorbs that tells you that you have certain stuff in your breath and you can go back. So this is starting to be used the research for diagnostics of uh, ulcer and other uh, uh, colon cancers and other applications. So this is a few future ones. And uh, there are about 20 companies now and I've started my own company in Quantum Cascade Laser. And our goal there, uh, it's the company is called EOS Photonics, is to make a kind of what I call a universal sensor. This is a chip that we can tune, contains many of these lasers, and we can fast tune the wavelengths over a huge range. And why is this important? To detect simultaneously a large number of chemicals. It's interesting from a fundamental science because the principle under, uh, under the quantum cascade lasers are, are very uh, different uh, than uh, uh, conventional laser. You see, a uh, quantum cascade laser is made of a semiconductor. Semiconductors are materials such as gallium arsenide, uh, uh, indium phosphide, uh, and so forth. And uh, semiconductor lasers, you know, are widely spread in the world. In fact, all uh, communication, fiber communication, are based on semiconductor lasers. The quantum cascade laser is a semiconductor laser, but very different from the one that I just talked. And again, the key point is you can design the emission wavelengths not by changing the material, which makes it very difficult. You know, if you want to change the wavelengths and each time you have to change the material, you have a problem. Each, every time you have to make a new laser. Here we can cover the whole inf mid infrared spectrum by changing the layers, thin layers of the active region. And in this way, we can make it widely tailorable and also tunable. The challenge was to make a a compact laser, in fact a semiconductor laser, a tiny laser, that could work efficiently in a region of the spectrum where there was, until then, uh, mid-90s, no good uh, semiconductor laser. In general, no, no good laser, except at very specific wavelengths. So we had this very interesting region of the spectrum where there were not many many good lasers. So the challenge, the key point was to realize that if we were able to engineer a particular semiconductor using nanotechnology made of nanometer thin layers, we could, uh, and inventing, if you like, a new laser scheme, a new laser principle, we could design a laser that we could tell it at what wavelengths to emit over a wide region. This was a huge step forward and then make it widely tunable. Now this has been done, what is the challenge? The challenge now is to uh, push these laser at even longer wavelengths. They work extremely well, they are powerful, they work at room temperature, but uh, up to wavelengths of, uh, you know, about uh, 10, 15 micron. The challenge is how can we make a high-performance quantum cascade laser that works at room temperature with reasonably high power at 100 micro. This is the far infrared. This will open up new applications. And yes, we have, uh, we have found an approach uh, recently which has shown the uh, path towards higher, higher power. So there's been a breakthrough in this year by a laboratory that has able, been able to achieve milliwatts of power level at room temperature at very long wavelengths. So this is a, an exciting area of research. Another one that we have been working on, and this opens the, actually opened for us the area of flat optics is the following. You see, one of my colleagues at Harvard asked me a key question once. Maybe he doesn't re, uh, remember, but I remember very well. That's Professor Jim Anders. He says, Federico, I want to fly your laser in my robotic aircrafts. In a robotic aircraft, there is very little space. This is a drone. So these lasers, they emit a widely divergent uh, light. This is typical of all semiconductor lasers. He says, Federico, I don't want to put optics in this little space. I don't have space. Can you somehow find a way to collimate 
the light so that instead of being divergent, it comes out parallel. So this made us think. So with a student of mine, we found a way that we could pattern the facet of these lasers with a nanostructure, a metal nanostructure, so that without using any outside lens, any optics, we would get a highly collimated beam. So this has been a breakthrough which is actually has led us, these are the first tentative steps that then led us to flat optics uh, and uh, so forth. So beam engineering, the ability to engineer not only the wavelength, but the quality of the beam coming out, make it collimated. Or then I had another brilliant student from France, from the Ecole Polytechnique, I asked him, can you, can you design a laser that emits multiple beams in different directions? This sounds like Star Wars, right? And he did it, okay? He designed the facet of the laser. He patented in a way that this laser emits uh, 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 light simultaneously in various directions of space which you can design. And so this opens up uh, and, and, and the next thing now, can we make a laser that uh, emits simultaneously many wavelengths? You know, this sounds strange. It's a laser, yes. It's called broadband or super continuum. And so we have been able to make quantum cascade laser that emit simultaneously many wavelengths, which is important scientifically and for applications. So it's kind of coming all together. So the significance of this is what I see that uh, the QC laser is uh, providing a solution for many important uh, technology uh, problems and the application area is dramatically a, a, a expanding right now. You know, from sensing to high power application, medicine, industrial application, um, combustion diag diagnostics, and so forth. Scientifically, there are still many open problems because the fundamentals of this laser are still not completely understood. It's still a young laser. So every year, we are discovering uh, uh, new things. I don't have the time to elaborate, but we discovered two years ago, together with some uh, with a, with some, with a Russian scientist and others, we discovered a phenomenon in this laser that had predicted in, back in the 60s and had never been observed before. So it's really a treasure trove of new science and the new technology. And we are just starting to see, I think, particularly applications to atmospheric science chemistry will be huge. <laughs>